Juan Benet is the founder of Protocol Labs and the inventor of the Interplanetary File System, a peer-to-peer -peer network for storing and sharing data. He's also the creator of Filecoin, a storage network incentivized by crypto. Juan's ventures are hugely ambitious, as they're in direct competition with the basic rails of the internet, protocols such as HTTP and data giants like AWS. Before we get into these projects, let's hear more about what led Juan to start IPFS and Filecoin. Thank you so much for that super kind, kind introduction. Um, and yeah, very excited to dig into, into all those topics. Uh, so I got started into um, this path by first kind of thinking about computing in a lower layer. So I came from studying distributed systems and networking and, and so on. And at that time, I was super uh, interested in peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks. So I had seen the rise of uh, BitTorrent and Skype as extremely like powerful ways of using computing to build um, extremely useful networks for for the world, um, and there kind of it always kind of struck me that um, the, the potential was enormous, and yet you know it was sort of missing like market oriented primitives. Um, and then later, uh, I got into uh, a lot of tooling for building um, knowledge graphs and building. Uh, improving science and kind of improving the rate at which we build, uh, uh, the rate at which we discover things and, and, um, and so on. And one, one serious problem in science is how do you deal with like vast quantities of data and how do you move around massive data sets? How do you verify their integrity? How do you make sure they haven't changed? Or if they do change, how do you track the version control and so on? And, and through that, like, uh, that's where IPFS came out of. It was thinking about how do you build better systems for, addressing and moving the data um, and it, with, with a goal of like kind of accelerating science and, and technology development. Um, and, and then separately, once you kind of had, you know, think of like Git version control and, and BitTorrent distribution and so on, um, once you kind of couple that to market incentives, that's where Falcon came out of. Uh, and so um, maybe, you know, this is not exactly my story, this is more of the story about I press on Falcon. Uh, maybe individually, I kind of uh, have always been I sort of grew up on the internet. Um, I started uh, programming from an early age, like uh, you know, 12, 13, I got into computers through games. Um, you know, you just, like play a lot of different kinds of RTSs and 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 so on, uh, and um, RPGs and whatnot. And I got into computers because I wanted to kind of make websites for uh, for like various skills and whatnot. And through that, um, it kind of then I got into uh, I always wanted to like learn everything, and so I kind of. Uh, you know, things like Wikipedia were like super exciting and super interesting. And so uh, to me, like the internet was super freeing. Um, I grew up in, in, uh, in Mexico and that gave me a phenomenal view into a lot of the world that is, you know, very different from um, say the U S or Europe uh, and kind of the challenges that people have in, in a lot of these, these other uh, places and communities. Um, but anyway, yeah, I kind of sort of like grew up on the internet and I consider myself more of a, an, a, a, person of the internet than any one, one location. And once the web sort of took hold and a lot of online communities and dis distributed, distributed communities started forming and our life started becoming much more about the interconnectivity between humans around the world around kind of shared values and shared goals and, um, and so on. Uh, that, that was, I think, extremely valuable and interesting and, and, and fruitful for, for the future. Uh, and I spent a lot of my time these days thinking about um, sort of like going back to some of the uh, of my roots in, in a lot of this around um, how do we accelerate science? How do we um, do more science and technology translation faster? Because you know I have a very um, optimistic, techno like rational or techno optimistic perspective around you know you, if you think about like the last few hundred years, we've had an enormous amount of um, improvement globally on almost any metric that we have about the human condition, like mortality's down, um, uh, poverty's down, access to um, resources is way better, um, uh, pursuing power globally is way better, uh, safety is way better, um, crime is way down. Like all, all the, all, every metric that we can think of is, is improving uh, broadly over, over the last few hundred years. And all of that is coming on the back of um, the scientific uh, improvements and the harnessing of that knowledge to build technology and diffuse it in the world and kind of broaden access to that, to that um, set of powers and so on. 
and the internet is the computing and the internet is kind of the the largest version of that. It is like the most powerful, most diffused um, kind of superpower machine where you know a group of people can get together, dream up a superpower, and code it up and <laughs> deploy it to the world like for basically for free, right? Like the, the it's amazing how you can kind of have amazing free distribution of superpowers to everybody in the world. And at the same time, it like the underlying primitives of that superpower machine really matter because um, how, what are the kind of structures and systems put in place to build the platform? Uh, those pieces really matter. So today, most of the internet, most of the web is in a very precarious position where um, most of it is kind of driven by centralized corporations and, and, and a few entities under the kind of control of individuals or, or a few kind of really powerful groups who are not optimizing for the um, success of those platforms. They're optimizing for their own um, kind of long-term, you know, financial success and whatnot, and, and maybe their own goals. Uh, and that, that doesn't kind of produce a, a very successful um, system for the rest of the world. Uh, and so I think we have this really good opportunity to upgrade the entire computing stack with much better primitives that build kind of these international utilities. So think of like having access to computing paradigms and, and you know, smart contracts and finance and um, personal storage and communication tools and so on with the same kind of reliability that you have access to water or electricity in some of the um, kind of most developed parts of the world, right? Like those, those things get built and supported by utilities, not, you know, um, kind of like super uh, high growth tech companies. They get deployed by these broader utilities wh whose mandate includes broadening access to everybody and establishing high quality, reliable service to everybody. And I think we need a, a computing platform that has that kind of property um, and it, done in an international way. And I think that's the, the really great promise of Web3 is to bring those kinds of primitives to the internet so we can kind of upgrade and, and build a drastically better stack um, to kind of, yeah, upgrade our superpower machine with, with that kind of security. So I'd love to understand where in this stack um, does IPFS and, and, and Filecoin, um, you know, fit. But before that, you know, I'd love to just take, take advantage of, uh, of, of this interview to really understand what that, like, what the internet stack looks like right now. Because, you know, I, I have, like, just, like, a vague idea of the different protocols that, that make, make it up. And, and it's so core to, to crypto and Web3 and what we're building. And you've, like... You know, you probably understand this deeper than the most uh, in, in this space. So I, I'd love, yeah, if you could just like give an overview. I, I love talking about this. So, um, and, and I think this is super important for everybody to know about the internet itself and how they use it. So um, at the end of the day, the internet is just a very large collection of computers, programs, wires uh, that are all interconnected through a set of protocols. And these protocols are, you know, Think of them as distributed programs where the code that's going to run um, gets written by a group of people and then gets copied out to all of them. And then everyone's kind of going to loosely agree to run the same thing or close to the same thing. And traditionally, the you know we didn't have blockchain, so we we had very rough ways of achieving consensus on what to run. So we had and, and it was all based on trust. So the initial layers of the stack include things like the IP protocol, the Internet Protocol, uh, where you know, if people are probably pretty familiar with IP addresses, and that comes from internet protocol addresses. And TCP, um, probably people have heard of TCP IP. TCP is the transport control protocol. And so all of the underlying network right now is based on these loose agreements that were based on um, protocols designed in the 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, things like the email protocol, and later on, the HTTP protocol, um, that were uh, kind of thought out by different groups uh, and proposed into a, a, a very kind of open source oriented community. It's open source before open source. So I always think of the um, open source movement as like the second or third installment of the same ethos um, where the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, had a very open source style structure where a lot of different 
researchers across institutions, universities, corporate research labs, and so on, were building together a set of uh, systems and protocols to interoperate across the US and Europe. And uh, then later that got extended to the rest of the world. Um, and those initial kind of discussions were foundational to the ethos of the entire network. Um, and the decisions that they made in the protocols themselves, like we're still living with those. Like the, the decisions that were put together in the 70s and 80s, put in place a structure for the internet that defined the development of the whole thing. And good news there is that they actually made extremely good decisions about the power structures and the openness and the interactivity um, and so on. And so, you know, we're, we, we have a phenomenally good open free system because those groups made very good decisions at the time. At the same time, they made some other decisions that were not as good in terms of, you know, some of the addressing or some of the, uh, you know, security was kind of like an afterthought and that has, you know, plagued <laughs> the internet for decades. Um, and the, uh, the routing, one, one piece here that's extremely important is the way that you do routing and addressing on the internet. That, that means how different computers or programs on the internet get an identifier that they can announce to the rest of the network and that they use to send and receive messages. So this is the core IP protocol and related protocol. So um, IP and BGP, the border gateway protocol and other kind of routing protocols. Um, th these protocols define how um, some program or computer is going to get an address. They're going to publish it to the network and they're going to be able to receive, send and receive messages to each other globally, you know, across nations uh, to trillions of devices at super fast speeds and whatnot. And so you can imagine how um, flexible this is supposed to be in terms of being able to deal with an enormous amounts of computers coming online and offline constantly and sending torrential amounts of data through all of these systems. And the amazing kind of triumph of the internet is that <laughs> so these like loose collection of protocols and programs worked like, and, and it worked through, you know, um, a combination of a bunch of companies and a bunch of nations and a bunch of academic groups that figured out how to do this and how to make it work out of this rough consensus and running code standards process with like terrible agreement primitives. You know, they did not have like a blockchain to be able to coordinate their work into, into um, success. But that underlying structure today um, has like some serious problems because uh, it, again, it was built into these kind of rough agreement, rough consensus, which means that a few groups today have significant power as defined by those protocols. So for example, like the, the border gateway protocol, which is a key thing that decides how large, um, you know, components of the network, uh, the, uh, which are sort of described as auto um, autonomous systems, uh, how, how you write, route information and packets from one of those to another and so on. The decisions being made there around how that those routing tables work and where do you send traffic and whatnot, all of that is happening completely in the clear based on like, high trust to specific institutions and so on. And so the in, entire kind of underlying foundation of all of the stuff that we're doing, all of the internet, all of the applications, all of the blockchains and so on is like fundamentally insecure. So it is fundamentally insecure and relies on trust. And that is a huge thing that we need to upgrade. Now, no project in the crypto space today is trying to tackle that. A number of projects have proposed to like potentially go after that at some point. Um, but it, that's kind of like, a, that's, that's one of the major things that we'll have to fix before we kind of upgrade the stack, you know, maybe five, 10 years out. And that's kind of like the underlying lowest la layer. There's, I guess, a layer underneath that, that that's kind of more oriented towards the hardware and like what you actually put into um, what, what kind of hardware devices do and what like your local area network might do. You think of like your computer and your phone and like your Wi-Fi router and maybe how that Wi-Fi router is part of like a building. That layer may have another set of protocols. This is where Ethernet comes in. Um, it's kind of like the layer underneath IP is Ethernet. Um, it's called, called like the link layer. Um, and that layer has a lot of implications, but the good news there is that the IP stack allows the layer to evolve independently. So you could have better layers that appear and upgrade the internet without having to um, get everybody to kind of change something. So that layer is like working pretty well and it does not require kind of significant security oriented improvements or does not require um, significant kind of restructuring with, with better primitives the way that the IP layer does. I think like the IP layer like, is, is in dire need for a much safer structure. Now the layer after that uh, above IP 
Um, that's where kind of you get into TCP, which is kind of the way in which you get reliable communication between things, or you might have heard of things like Quick or um, other transport control protocols that allow, or like noise um, and other protocols that allow kind of secure communications. That's a layer that um, it's just kind of like, how do you build reliable, secure communication between programs on top of this kind of large packet oriented uh, network? And that's where, you know, a lot of work like HTTPS, uh, so, you know, TLS, which is a big upgrade to um, HTTP to, to secure it, uh, came in uh, to support, like noise has been super useful. Uh, a lot of the Lip2P project, Lip2P is a project that, that we started that also uh, became part of ETH2 and Polkadot and a number of other blockchains kind of sits at that layer. It's kind of like, how do you think about securing the communications in a, in a way that doesn't depend on um, central authorities and, and so on. And then once you kind of establish secure communication between programs, then you can start reasoning about the data and how the data moves and programs and what programs are running and what services are running. And that's the realm of HTTP and the realm of IPFS and the realm of blockchains and, and so on, where you can start kind of, now that you have kind of the, the lowest layer kind of connectivity between different computers of so being able to send messages to each other in a local area network, you've wired those, and that's kind of like the link layer, you've wired those together into a broader internet through the IP layer, the network layer. Um, and once you have established a way to have like reliable, secure, private communications between programs, then on top of that, you can build like the data addressing and data movement protocols. Um, and so HTTP is, you know, kind of the most successful of those. Um, you know, before HTTP, there was things like FTP, uh, the file transfer protocol and, um, and other things. HTTP was by far the most successful, um, and that kind of gave us the web and, and, and more. Email was kind of another, SMTP email is like another very successful protocol. Um, and that's sort of like where IPFS sits. IPFS sits there to try and change the addressing and the structure of how we move around data uh, to maybe make it content addressed. I won't, won't go into detail yet. I uh, kind of like maybe want to talk one, about one more layer, like in the application layer uh, before that. Um, but blockchain sort of sit at that layer too, where um, you're able to kind of uh, coordinate a bunch of programs and a bunch of computers to de define like the data structures that you're moving and what the, the data structures mean, what programs you're going to run, how you're going to connect and so on. But like important here is that all of that is sitting at a pretty high layer relative to everything underneath. And in order for us to achieve extremely secure blockchain systems and extremely secure finance, worldwide finance, and, and a successful superpower machine for everybody, we need to kind of like sync the successes of the of the platform lower into those lower layers. So like we need to make the connectivity between all you know reliable private communications sound like not just encrypted traffic, but we need reader writer privacy. Meaning we need mixed nets and we need the ability to like kind of like hide traffic because um, otherwise you get serious censorship problems like we just saw in Iran and we've seen in Egypt and we saw in Spain even in other places. Um, and then underneath that, we need to improve the IP layer, uh, and, and we need probably a blockchain-oriented analog of BGP to create a routing structure that enables us to um, have a much more you know secure foundation for um, for the internet connectivity. Um, and so, like, I, I think that we can definitely get there, but it's going to require an enormous amount of work from a lot of different groups and, and, and whole new projects that haven't even been designed yet in order to to get there. Um, and that's, I think, like, you know, the big promise of Web3 is to, is to be able to kind of upgrade the whole stack with these kind of public verifiability primitives. Um, and maybe I'll, like the applications. And, and so all of this is kind of sitting underneath the application stack. So like your particular application, like uh, uh, um, a, a web page that you go visit um, or a, um, an application that you download and run either on your phone, like, you know, think of like Twitter or Google Docs or uh, Notion or whatever. All of that sits on top of like all of these other layers, um, and the traffic of those applications gets like wrapped or encapsulated in like, as it kind of tr transfers through these layers between them. And so we kind of have to go layer by layer and assess how do we add public verifiability, how do we add better security, how do we add better trust primitives to to the whole thing. Um, and so we're kind of like working our way down, which is fine. It's a it's a good direction to go because you can kind of like. Uh, provide some successes there, and if they they work well, then you can kind of scale them, and then and then uh, go lower. Uh, historically, there's been attempts to go the other way, like start at the bottom and kind of improve the bottom and work your way up, and those have not succeeded. Like there was a um, a strong effort in the 
eighties and nineties and early two thousands to like improve, like upgrade the internet from the bottom up. And like, it just never worked. Um, and so you kind of have to start from the application and you work your way down. Uh, this is kind of for adoption reasons. Um, and so it's working, but like we need to kind of follow through and like, you know, kind of upgrade the whole, the whole system. Sorry, that was a lot. Let, let me no, know if you want to dig into was, any piece. Uh, so, oh. so interesting. Uh, I, I love kind of getting more, more clarity on all the layers that make up the internet. Um, I think just to summarize, uh, you start at the at, like at the very very lowest la layer. You have kind of the the hardware, right? Like the yep. you know the e Ethernet cables and stuff that connect uh, computers and programs and stuff. Um, then you have the actual like the IP layer, um, and and that's that defines how these um, addresses and computers actually connect uh, and send and receive messages. Then you have the TCP layer um, that defines uh, how to make these messages and this communication secure and reliable. Um, and then you have the HTTP, SMTP uh, layer, and that's how data um, moves. So that's kind of the like email protocol, and that's where most blockchains sit right now. It, blockchains yep. are additional protocols in, in this same HTTP layer that figured out a trustless way to essentially move data. Um, and it happens that, you know, in the case of blockchains, like I, I, I'd say they, they, they take a step further to like previous internet pro protocols in that that data is also, also has also like verifiable value right it's 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 yep. not just like communications like messages but it's it's actually you know uh money so yep. i think that's that's kind of the, the key innovation um there and then there's the application layer uh, and and that's what most of us you know uh, think of when when we think of the internet just like the websites we use the apps yep. that we use yeah that's exactly right and and um the this this kind of separation comes from um, two kind of branches of work, like the the OSI layer um, layering model of the internet. Uh, I forgot what OSI stands for, um, but that's kind of like what the, what the way it's been described. And then that or the TCP/IP stack also kind of described this way. And so it's kind of like the lowest layer is described as you know, th there's like kind of like the physical layer, which is like the, literally the wires and the electrons moving. Then on top of the physical layer, you end up with the link layer, and so like that's Ethernet and so on. Then the network layer, and so that's IP and, and re related protocols. On top of that, you have the transport layer, so that's the TCP IP and, sorry, TCP and Quick. But I would also lump in all the secure communication stuff in there, like TLS and noise and a bunch of other things and other upgrades. And on top of the transport layer, you get the data layer, which is kind of HTTP, um, and SMTP and blockchains and whatnot, and on top of that, the application layer. Yeah, sorry, I didn't give the names earlier, and that was my my uh, my mistake. Uh, but yeah, because I think it's like more important to like think of them as the protocols. And all these layers are kind of fuzzy. Like, th there's no kind of strict separation anywhere. There, there's some s separations, but you can kind of blend the layer sometimes. And sometimes people talk about having like a 2.5 layer or a 3.5 layer, where like you in insert like shim protocols in between, and it's all software at the end of the day. It's all like some program that's going to run wrapped into another program, wrapped into another program, wrapped into another program. And so the, the, the separations are like good for us to reason about, but in reality, underneath the hood is very messy in terms and things kind of call each other and, and so on. So here's a big question. What's the most important thing about crypto? It's not transactions per second. It's not convenience and it's not even smart contracts. It's decentralization to achieve censorship resistance so we can all be free. Minima is a new layer one blockchain designed to run in full on a smartphone. Join hundreds of thousands of node runners on Minima's incentive program today to start earning Minima every day until mainnet launch. Get started at minima.global. Juan pointed out that all the layers of the internet that run below the application layer rely on trust. We can assume that since they don't behave like companies that have stock, public financial records, or even blockchains with tokens. They're simply open source protocols. So who's running them? So, um, and this answer has changed a lot over the decades and all of this predates open source even. Um, so the, a lot of different organizations 
build and maintain these protocols and, and they build and maintain the description of the protocol. So like the specifications of how the protocol should work, like the, the written documents that humans are going to read and then use to implement the programs. And then they also maintain implementations of those uh, protocols. Um, and the organizations have changed a lot. So initially it started with um, academic groups hired by governments, uh, you know, most famously like the, you know, the Ar ARPA, the, the Advanced Research Projects Agency of the U.S., like this before, like, you know, in, in the Cold War started a lot of the work here to build all of these protocols. Um, and it was sort of coordinated by the IPTO, which is, the, I think, the um, I think it's Information Processing Technical Office or something like that. I may be getting the name wrong, but this, is, I think, is one of the most um, influential groups in history, uh, just in terms of defining our world today. And it was a tiny, like relatively small office with a, you know, sizable, sizable budget, but in reality, like small in comparison to the, say, the Saturn Apollo program or um, the Manhattan Project or, or any of the major efforts of like the 50s, 60s, 70s. And that group defined the structure of the internet, defined the, gave a lot of funding to various academic groups to kick off the implementations of these protocols. It sort of defined the collaborative culture of different groups coming up with different ideas with different um, uh, specifications that eventually ended up giving way to the Internet Engineering Task Force, the IETF, that sort of formalized how to talk about these protocols, how to define the specs, how to send the specs for um, around between groups. In fact, the, the idea of an RFC, which is kind of like the way that you define specs across open source, comes from the IETF because they used to send messages to each other with the question request for comments. And so RFC came from the IETF. And so all the specs in that define the internet are described as, as a specific numbered RFC, like RFC one, RFC, RFC two, RFC three. And, you know, today when we think about uh, like an EIP, um, you know, EIP 1559 or EIP um, or an ERC20 or something like that, that comes from that original way of numbering those specific specifications. Um, and then those, the, the ITF started involving, grew from academic research labs to corporate research labs to then entire corporations formed for the purpose of advancing the networking. And a lot of this was thanks to massive capital investments from the US and several European nations. And then later, many other nations around the world that helped seed the construction of the entire internet. And this took like three to four decades. So it was not kind of just the 90s. Um, th that's when the internet was opened up to most people on the planet. Um, this happened in the 70s and 80s uh, as well, and, and with precursors in the 60s. Uh, so it's been like a, a 50 year journey to get where we are. And a lot of these protocols were defined and discussed and implemented by many different groups with many different incentives and funding sources, but overall broadly aligned with the goal of creating this kind of broad, free, open platform that anybody could use. Um, and initially for you know, military purposes, that's where you know, ARPA, uh, ARPA's investment came from. It was kind of a like defense-oriented way of like surviving a um, you know, nuclear attack. Um, but then later on, it was much more about sharing information, coordinating, um, and that's when all the hypertext history also came in of like using all of this amazing computing medium to help humanity think together, help humanity solve problems together, help organize and coordinate us to solve like massive scale problems together. And so the original kind of coordination, using computers to improve human coordination is kind of the founding of hypertext and, you know, um, and, and like that computing, computing's evolution itself, like comes from, comes from, from that. So to your point about like trust, so today, because we didn't have software-based structure or internet-based structures to establish um, guarantees like we do now, like now we have cryptography and now we have uh, mechanism design and blockchain so we can create strong um, rights and strong um, uh, mechanisms that enforce certain behaviors. Before, all of this was based entirely on trust. And so you sort of had to hope that organizations would honestly implement protocols and wouldn't cheat. And this led to 
tons of problems along the way. Um, but it, but it, but overall has worked out, meaning like um, there were incentives to participate, incentives to work together, because if everybody kind of roughly stuck to the protocol, then things would work better. And the value of the network was better than not having the network. And so um, many groups kind of played by the rules for for many decades until kind of the 90s. Once the, the access was broadened, that's when a ton of the kind of um, opportunities for abuse skyrocketed. And that's where like a lot of the security concerns came out. Um, you know, there were, there were some other like security, important security upgrades happened earlier, but that was more about like national security or like international security of different kinds and like protecting financial transactions between banks and between groups. But like most people like never had any exposure to that. Um, but kind of in the nineties, once everybody got access to the, to the web and people started sending around messages to each other and putting in credit cards over the internet and all of that, that's when you really needed security. Uh, and then from there, we got to like, hey, actually, now that we have cryptography, can we just go back and upgrade the whole stack to start piece by piece replacing it with much stronger and much more secure versions? And this is why I think is like the big shift of Web3. So um, you've probably seen like diagrams from like web comparing Web1, Web2, and Web3. Uh, as like, I, I, It's one of the things like I claim a bit of credit for where uh, it's one of the first groups like first person to put together like that web one diagram, web two diagram, web three. And the way that I described it then was uh, web one is sort of read only. Uh, it gave you the ability to kind of like send around information to, to read it. Web two gave you read write interactivity so that you could um, uh, not only consume information, but as a user, you could also like start writing and producing uh, more, more information. And web three gives you trust. And the way that we get trust out of the system is we add public verifiability. So you, so it's like a read-write trust system. Um, this is different from other conceptions of Web3. Other groups kind of think about it as in terms of like read-write-own because you have like property rights. Um, but, you know, you can think of property rights and like read-write-own as a subset of trust. Uh, if you have like read-write-trust, um, that trust you can establish gives you property rights, but it also gives you other kind of rights. Like it gives you um, the rights to communicate, the rights to assemble, the right to like, um, you know, wake up the next day and have still have access to your data <laughs> like that's less about property and more about like access or something like that um and the way that we establish we, it's kind of like this semantically confusing thing because you want the system itself to be trustless in a sense you know you don't have to trust it because you have public verifiability but because of that because of that public verifiability you then kind of develop a a, a um, system that you can indeed rely on, that you, you can rely on or, you know, slash trust the system because you have public verifiability underneath the hood. Um, or, or maybe a better way to kind of describe this might be read, write, verifiability, uh, read, write, verify or something. I think it's, it's, you know, described like that, it's kind of a miracle that the internet even worked out. You know, it's like, <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's it like is. such a mess of different protocols yes. and they're all being funded and coordinated by governments that, mm -hmm. you know, need to work together. Um, and, you know, when has that ever happened successfully? You know, it's it's pretty amazing that the Internet is kind of what, what it is and, and where it is today. We also have better governments. So um, I think today we're used to like these like highly dysfunctional, super bureaucratic, bloated governments. But this is not the governments of the 50s and 60s. Um, the governments of the 50s and 60s came out of World War II and they were super competent and super efficient because they had to be like they had just kind of like fought and won or lost or like almost lost a, a world war. And so you had like super hyper efficient governments. And so in the 50s and 60s, you had these groups that were able to coordinate. I mean, like, you know, the the, uh, the space race was a government program, right? Like the Saturn V and the Apollo rockets were built by governments like NASA was a government thing. Um, the like all, all of these efforts were like super efficient, but that was because we had much better governments at the time. Um, they were just way more competent and organized. And um, now all of that has sort of like bloated over the decades and has given us like a super highly bureaucratic, very slow moving thing. It's kind of like organizational rot. Um, it's kind of like happens throughout history. And so today we're just kind of like dealing with governments that don't move at all like fast and uh, super painful to like change anything. And so, yeah, then we had to sort of like exit from those and then just build a better future through through software. Um, but but it's like, yeah, it's like the, the thankfully we got the Internet in that period where these governments were super competent. And now and, and thankfully, like the people that built these systems 
didn't knew the importance of decentralization. So the, the decentralization ethos has been part of the internet from the get-go. The original creators of a lot of these specs and, and systems um, build networks that were meant to not have central command and control because they knew the dangers of that. And they were especially concerned with two things. One was um, the risk of a cent central point of failure that you could like take out, like and this is kind of where the nuclear concern came from. Like you, if, if, uh, if the enemy can just nuke one place, then the whole thing falls apart. So we can't have that. We have to build some decentralization into the network. Um, and the second one was, what if some other groups infiltrate and take over that thing? You don't want that thing to be bad. And so suddenly you, you, you land in decentralization again. And so that's why all of the internet programs from the get-go were built to be um, very, very decentralized. Um, unfortunately, the, the, that decentralization gave way to centralization in the 90s. Um, and that's when the commercial interests came in and it became like highly profitable to centralize access to information. And I kind of describe this as like hyper centralization because it's part of the hyperlink structure of the web. So this is a, like, I, I claim that the, like a bigger part of the centralization that we're fighting today is a consequence of the addressing scheme in HTTP. So HTTP use an addressing scheme where you address information between pages and websites and so on by the domain name, which usually meant a particular organization. And so what, you, what that meant is that the entire information structure of the web that we all use, the way that programs communicate with each other, the way that we address documents, the way that we address pictures, the way that we address all our data, the way that you tell someone else to go look at something, all of that has embedded in it this like nefarious organization structure. Like, you know, you say HTTP colon slash slash, you know, facebook.com slash mypicture.jpg. Like that puts a strong hyper-centralizing influence into the entire structure of the, of, of the web data flow, meaning it forces information to accumulate into silos that are going to be more reliable, that are going to be easier to use and so on. And it makes it harder to move away because if you want to take your picture and take it from Facebook into, um, I don't know, take uh, some other, you know, Google Photos or like um, Notion or whatever, you then have to break the link. You have to now address it somewhere else. And it was just kind of too complicated for people to everyone create their own domains and their own structure and so on. And so like that, like it's kind of like these weird, bizarre things that the addressing structure itself was a big reason why we got this massive centralization power. So you had two, two things going on, like the addressing scheme and then the massive incentive from corporations to try and extract as much value as possible out of the, out of the data they accumulated. So you got like this, you know, data siloing effect where as soon as people realized the data was the new oil and it was very successful, then these, a few corporations were able to kind of centralize all of the information and force everyone to come to them for it. Um, and kind of like the, the strongest one of these was, was Google, who, was, who then put itself even as an intermediary between all the addressing. And was like, no, 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 don't link to things, just search for them. Uh, like, like much, much better that you come through us uh, than, than you kind of like interlink things. And um, you can find it all over the place. Like all kinds of Google products tend to disprefer links, links and linking things and prefer to like force you back into search. And uh, yeah, so it's kind of like a wild, but like those kind of choices that made a lot of sense at the time just kind of ended up causing this kind of impact downstream that we now have to undo. That's crazy that it, the, the structure for um, data addressing with, you know, this, you know, what started as like a government led, like open source protocol, HTTP led to, to this kind of centralization and just like five uh, huge, uh, you know, tech companies. Um, yeah. and, and so this is, you know, where, you know, I, I think it makes sense to get deeper into IPFS and, and, and Filecoin. So how, like, how are you trying to Yeah, fix exactly. This? So this is like, this is literally one of the key things that a lot of us are working on is like, how do you, un, how do you provide a better addressing structure for the data? And that's one of like maybe IPFS's strongest contributions is to come up with a different addressing model for how do you address and connect data and programs on the on the internet and so the 
addressing model for the data is we use a thing called CIDs or SIDs, content identifiers. And so the idea there is that you interlink um, data to each other by the SID. Um, and that gives you a link that's independent of the organization. And so, uh, uh, and, and to be fair, like uh, Tim Berners-Lee, who kind of invented the web uh, originally and wrote the HTTP protocol, also recognized this problem early on and tried to create not just URLs, which were, you know, uh, resource locators, um, but instead tried to push the web towards URIs, which and using numbers and and because because he noticed a problem too, but it was sort of like too late and the URI structure didn't have a good answer to who assigns these numbers and how do you relate them and so on. And that's where IPFS CIDs have a really strong contribution, which is um, they give you a structure to address the information based on the information itself. Meaning you take the information and you derive a fingerprint for the information, a cryptographic print fingerprint. Um, that, that is, we can use the hash of the information or something like that. And we can then interlink documents to each other, photos to each other, um, you know, folders and so on, but also databases like these specific database records, web pages, applications, all of the links can now be interlinked through the content address, meaning the address of the content itself, not the location address. So think of it, the HTTP link as being a location oriented address where um, you give somebody an address based on where the thing is. And we're moving from that to a content address, which is a link based on what the content is, not where it is. So it's the, the, I kind of tend to use this analogy where like, imagine if I told you to read a book or listen to a po podcast or something. And the way that I described it was by, and, and sort of like the link or directions that I gave you was to describe it in terms of where the thing is, not what it is. And so like, Hey, like check out this amazing book. Um, you really must read it. It is in the New York public library on, you know, the, second floor on like this particular room in this particular stall in this particular like shelf. And that's what you should go read. And you have like no idea what I'm talking about other than like the directions of where to get it. And unfortunately that's how the web works today. It is totally insane. By the time you go there and get there and look at the, try to look for the book, the book may have changed. It may be a different thing. Somebody may have misplaced it or what's even more ridiculous. Sometimes you get there and you're like, Oh, I've already read this book. Or like, Oh wow. It was like, I actually had this in my backpack the whole time. And that's how the web works today. Like, you go to your email, you get a link there and you click it and you open your browser and your browser then is told like, Hey, go and fetch this particular information from this particular place. And it has to go and talk to that particular server, ask a query and get back a response, uh, only to find out that, Hey, like that resource was already in your computer or Hey, that resource was already open in another tab or whatever. And you know, the, the contribution there from IPFS is like, try to shift from that to a model where, we address the information based on the contents identifier. Like the link should have a hash of the data that you're trying to access or should have some other, some way to interlink one document to another document based on what the thing is, not where it is. Having these hashes that link to the content itself. Um, yeah, like that sounds, it, it, it makes sense, but how practical is it? Like it, it's, you know, like a hash is like this jumble of like numbers and letters. So like how, like how, um, practical, how can you make it kind of user friendly to, to have this new, like different system? Yeah. Yeah. It's a great point. So, so basically like it is, it's pretty annoying to have to write out a hash by hand or to, to type it anywhere. And so there's, there's two answers to that. One is, um, you can have sort of like the entry point, which is kind of the first thing that people see or type and, and so on. And you can try to make that user friendly and find a good way to have stable identifiers that are um, more long-term oriented that are not, or, or that allow some mutability, but that are not or, oriented in terms of the location. So for example, if we have a naming system that's independent of location and it's more associated with the data itself, that's already an improvement. Now it might mutate or change or some, something, but it might not be dependent on, on, um, on where the thing is. So for example, this might be like an ENS name that points to a website. Uh, as a hash. And so you might have like um, Camilla.eth. Uh, I don't know if that's like your, your uh, ENS name, maybe a different one, but uh, e you know, Juan Bennett.eth, um, that points to a specific CID in Ethereum. And so I can have, you know, 
um, an address like IPFS colon slash slash or even HTTP colon slash slash Juanbenet.eth slash my picture. And that is no longer dependent on the specific programs or, or the specific um, computers that I originally put the data in. You first do a lookup into a blockchain. You resolve what that name is supposed to point to. You get the hash. And then now that you have the hash, you can go and find it anywhere. And so you still have that name resolution problem of like, you have to translate a human readable name to a hash, um, but you kind of solve that once. And then separately, most of the links in the web are not ever read or, or touched by humans at all. They're kind of interlinks, interlinking between pieces of information or databases or records and so on. And there you can just use the hashes directly. Um, or, or you might have like a mutable reference, but but you, but you want it to be stable and independent of location. And so kind of like a lot of this kind of separating and introducing a naming system or addressing system in between where documents interlink to each other or like, you know, data interlinks to each other and, and where sort of a human, humans try to get it. But, but, but we have like the ability to do this now. Like we, you have, you can have a human readable, nice looking name that is independent of the specific servers that you used originally to store and distribute the data. And you can do that today with Ethereum and IPFS, which is super cool. Um, you know, that's a big result that like we worked on for you know last four or five years, uh, chipping away the problem, like making CIDs, making them addressable, having HTTP gateways, bringing the standards to work with protocol identifiers in the browser, um, then ENS appearing, uh, ENS being able to link to CIDs, um, then creating a resolver to have like ETH link work, um, so that you could have you could take a standard browser today and try to access the content and it'll use a DNS resolver that asks Ethereum where, what the name is pointing to, and then it fetches the content from a specific, uh, you know, IPFS node that has the, the website. And like, that's super cool. Like that's already kind of independent of the specific location. Now it's dependent on a specific blockchain um, or a specific naming system to give you some resolution. Um, but that's kind of a very deep fundamental problem that you can't get. Like, if you want nice human readable names, you need consensus over what that name is pointing to at a particular given moment in time. And, you know, it's unlikely that we want persistent identifiers forever with a specific name. Like, um, yeah. And I think as, as we move into more like things like QR codes and other kinds of link structures, um, you know, some the, the importance of human readability will will decrease. Uh, especially once we have VR or AR, like people will be typing links less. Web3 is weighed down by fragmented experiences becoming more of an obstacle for users rather than a warm invitation. Core seeks to erase these points of friction. Built by the team behind Avalanche, Core is an all-in-one command center for Web3, supporting Avalanche, Ethereum, and Bitcoin, a rich ecosystem of dApps, Bitcoin and Ethereum bridges, NFTs, subnets, and more. Download the Core browser extension to get started and connect to the Core web to unlock additional features at core.app. One of the key innovations of IPFS is in data addressing, which increases the efficiency of data fetching. But there's more to IPFS than just this. Juan will now get into all of these other features. Yeah, so this is kind of the initial separation I chose for IPFS and Filecoin, where um, I sort of the thinking here was that one protocol should be focused on the addressing and how we move the data. And that's where IPFS uh, handles the problem. It's like IPFS defines the addressing and IPFS gives you the protocols by which you go and find the content and fetch it and display it locally. And a different protocol should address how you store and pay for the storage of the data. And that, that separation is pretty important because you may have a lot of incentive structures on how you decide to store something. Like you could have completely altruistic cases or a model where um, a community together is going to decide to like store and, and share the, the the distribution of the data without a currency. And so I, I kind of want to very explicitly separate the, the notion of kind of incentivizing a community to um, share resources uh, like storage as a separate piece. And so that's where Filecoin comes in. Um, you can think of IPFS as kind of mapping to HTTP and Filecoin mapping to Amazon S3 or, you know, Google Cloud Object Storage or um, something like that. And so the so IPFS tells you how to address the data, how to find it, how to get it. Um, 
and how to you know move the bytes from one computer to another and like you know how, how do you how does your computer go and find out where the data is how do you request it how do you get it um, from who do you request it and so on and Filecoin is a way of organizing lots of people around the planet to provide super uh, reliable um, high quality of service very cheap storage to people, organizations, applications, and so on. And, and that's kind of like one of many possible storage mediums that you could have for, for IPFS. And so the, the separation of layers here, very inspired by, by the original kind of separation of layers in, in the internet, right? So TCP and IP uh, are separated into layers for good reason. Um, similar here, like Falcon and, and IPFS are separated into two layers. Um, the, it, where, the, the big contribution of Falcon is to use a cryptocurrency to organize a, a cryptocurrency and a blockchain to organize um, people around the planet to provide that storage. Um, and it's been kind of amazingly successful how quickly we've been able to amass a massive scale network. Um, you know, it's kind of defied all our expectations. We didn't expect to amass that much storage that quickly. It's like super, super, super cool. And it just shows how powerful uh, incentives are and how powerful open permissionless networks really are. And I think this is one of these kind of important results that's staring us all in the face because it's one of the first things that came in um, from even from Bitcoin, where you know you create this open permissionless network, anyone can join it, anyone can download the code, and you're incented to help run it because you get like some other reward for running the, the blockchain. And it's just a tremendously powerful structure to enable anyone around the planet to come in, help provide the service, and help the system run. And that, you know, just goes to show how um, how quickly Web three systems can scale. Uh, we went from you know zero to sixteen exabytes in a couple of years, uh, which is uh, way faster than any centralized cloud storage network um, had ever done it. You know, requiring you know massive capital investments to build out all of the hardware and storage facilities and teams of people organized to provide high quality services and reliable um, systems and so on. And um, and it was yeah. So so like yeah, it, it's sort of like a scale that we're arriving at is now competitive with centralized cloud providers uh, way faster than we sort of expected to, which is pretty really cool. That's crazy. But can you give us a sense of like, um, okay, so you, you mentioned kind of the amount of data, but just to put it in perspective, it like as a percentage of what, what Amazon is doing or Google Cloud or something. And, and like, if, if you can just like put into context both like the data that you're dealing with and also, I don't know if you, you have like, just like, like user numbers um, to get a sense of adoption. The scale of capacity. So this is the capacity build out, not the. I mean, we'll talk about the storage use in a moment. The capacity build out is about one percent of the cloud storage on the planet, which is huge. Uh, so this means it's like about an order of magnitude away from the large players. So groups like Amazon and Google and others have hundreds of exabytes, maybe approaching a zettabyte, um, but they don't say have ten zettabytes um, now. All of this is on a fast growth curve, like all other um, growth curves on in computing, in that it's kind of this exponential is going to keep growing. And so Falcoin and all of the centralized cloud players are going to have to keep growing the, the, the scale of these networks into zettabytes um, and then yottabytes and, and so on. So, you know, staggering amounts of data. Um, now, in terms of the capacity use, so we focus very hard first on building up the network and growing capacity. And that was kind of like year one. Uh, year two, we focused on onboarding. And so we went from having 20 petabytes of, uh, of storage use at the beginning of, of this year to now having over 300. So that's about a 15x growth in the use of the network in just this year alone, which is like super, super massive. Um, and so the, the, the shift there was like uh, all of Web3 fits, like so, so kind of, all the, all the Web3 data that we think about in terms of blockchains and all the Web3 applications and so on, all of that fits within 10 petabytes. So when we think about Falcon, it's like, you, like Falcon immediately like launched this massive amount of capacity and then could store all of Web3 many times over 
right away. And then, and all of that meant like almost nothing compared to the level of capacity that we have. So we're like, oh, damn, like, what do we do? Like, great. So we onboarded all of Web3. Now what? Like, uh, so now that forced us to focus on Web2. So now in order to kind of um, use this amazing resource, we now have to like help Web3 cross the chasm in terms of now making these platforms useful for Web2 groups. So like the the kind of um, the adoption of Falcoin in Web3 is driven primarily through these kind of un, uh, storage on ramps like Web3.storage and NFT.storage and various uses, users of IPFS. And so most of Web3 data is on, on Falcon already. Um, and so now the, the, the adoption path is to look at Web2 large scale operations and bring those into Web3. And that's much harder because these groups are not used to Web3 at all. And so you had to kind of come in and convince large organizations and large enterprises and large um, governments and so on to try out these new Web3 powered systems and um, do pilots with them and help them get comfortable. Uh, they often have feature requests and you have to do a bunch of feature build outs for, uh, to fit their needs and help them onboard, um, you know, this massive amounts of data. And like, that's also been pretty successful this year. Like we have worked on bringing on massive scale data sets from universities, from governments, from, uh, large companies. And all of it is like now pushing onto these large scale, you know, tens of petabytes to hundreds of petabytes level um, use. And uh, yeah, that's like what's super exciting. And so the, the onboarding uh, stuff for this year and next year is about bringing in those massive scale data sets onto, onto the network. But it's sort of like not the Web3 companies because the Web3 companies don't generate enough data. Like the, the, the Web3 companies already, we have all of those onto, on Falcon. It's just kind of like not not big enough. Now, now we need to kind of help bring Web2 clients in, which is kind of a great problem to have because it sort of forces us as a project to help push Web3 into Web2 Web and kind of like help transition a lot of the Web2 customers into Web3. Um, and one of the big, and that's kind of why one of the big focuses for us now is bringing computation and programmability to Falcoin because, you know, one of the number one things that people want to do once they store their data somewhere is they want to run programs over that data. They want to be able to run large scale computational pipelines on them. Like they want to run, you know, machine learning models, or they want to run kind of standard kind of data set cleanup operations, or, um, you know, it's kind of the traditional MapReduce type of, or Hadoop style use cases or Apache Spark and so on, like these massive scale, um, uh, data pipeline processing things. And that's kind of the, the next frontier for us. It's we're building, the first, the addition of programmability and through smart contracts on Falcon. So that's adding the FVM into Falcon. And then after that is adding the ability to then run programs over all of the data that you have on Falcon. And we call that compute over data networks where you, you're issuing compute operations over the data that you have in Falcon. And you can think of those as L2s on top of Falcon as an L1. So you can think of Falcon as, a, as an L1 where you would store and address your, your data and then you use L2 computer data networks to kind of run high performance computation over your whatever data you have stored. So, okay, so summarizing the, the adoption question, um, you said that uh, you have the, the capacity of storing about 1% of like all of Web2 data right now, right? Like if, if you look at Google and, and Amazon, it's it's one percent of the of the hardware of like the hardware dedicated to cloud storage, um, and so that means it's probably a higher percentage of the data that's stored because all a lot of that data is uh, is, is replicated because you want to store many copies of data um, because you don't want like you need to you know for safety reasons and, and reliability you want to have many copies so that if you lose some copies it's okay um, so the you know that, that probably means we have a higher it's hard to establish what percentage of this it might mean, but we, we did this large estimation exercise uh, a couple of years ago where we tried to kind of estimate the sizes of various different large scale data sets around the world, including massive scale things like all of YouTube and all of um, all of the social networks and all of the personal storage things like Dropbox and whatnot. And all of those end up numbering in kind of like the single exabytes or like maybe 10 exabytes in like the, the um, higher scale so we can we can take all we can take 
either many of those applications all wholesale, or we can take a few of like the biggest ones today. Um, and you know, if we keep growing uh, at the current, uh, you know, the rates that we've had, like we'll we can now start being competitive with a with like the cloud source players. Now that's different from all the data that's generated. So all the data that's generated isn't stored uh, because it's just too expensive. So think of like the um, LHC or like ma massive, massive computational pipelines generate massive amounts of data that's just thrown away because it's just too expensive to store it. So, so you have, you know, some, uh, you know, a, 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 some percentage, I don't know, a, one to five or whatever, but like that, that's the order of magnitude of capacity. And then from that, you have um, a, of like the, the data that's actually in a file coin, uh, a, a, a slice of, of the, the full capacity. Um, and a lot of the data that's, that's in file coin is coming from Web3. So the challenge now is to get Web2 to store its data in, in Filecoin. And so to do that, kind of the next steps that you're looking at are to um, have programmability so that people can, can run machine learning and other stuff uh, with their data, um, and then computation. And those, that's kind of like the layer two uh, that's, you know, that should be built out. Yeah, and so I think, uh, and, and not to say that um, the, like, there are a lot of like really interesting Web3 applications that we are supporting and grow and, and helping grow. Uh, so think of it kind of like there's this traditional um, way of seeing how uh, new innovations diffuse into markets where uh, they sort of start with new adopters in building new applications. But those new applications usually are too small to occupy the, the large set of resources. You can think of the the cloud itself, like the centralized cloud provider, started this way. So the the you know think of Amazon when it started. First, it was an internal product to help Amazon itself store and distribute its own data. Then they opened that up to uh, the world, but it was primarily startups and students that started using it. And because like you know large companies didn't want to trust this like new system yet. Um, and then after years, like then larger companies started using it. And after you know years of AWS implementing features that companies wanted, they started then attracting the other larger companies and eventually like large scale enterprises. Even today, the AWS as a, as a business is still working on transitioning large enterprises, large Fortune 500 companies and governments and so on from their own deployments over to the centralized cloud. And so this is kind of like a, a kind of diffusion of innovation thing where like you have the 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 last paradigm being you know kind of like the, the the kind of two paradigms ago being still transitioned into the last paradigm while when the new paradigm comes in and starts transitioning the new players and so similarly to this like when Falcon first started and, and, and opened up like the first set of users made sense to be all web3 users that were already kind of using IPFS or that would be able to like leverage a lot of the um Falcon uh, use cases, and so think of that as like the startups and students model of like of the cloud or Amazon. And now that all of those folks have are now using Falcon and, and are growing, um, but they're not say like growing fast enough, then we can now focus on transitioning some of the more um, larger scale users out there, like the you know traditional companies and governments and universities. Uh, you know, universities here are a really interesting um, set of users for Falcon because. Um, they, they tend to want to do these massive scale experiments that produce massive amounts of data, and then they want to run large scale computation. And they're super cost sensitive because, you know, they're not super well funded like uh, large corporations. And so for them, a cost reduction, like what Falcon is able to give them, is super, super meaningful. And they're willing to trade off, you know, missing features uh, over that. Right. So the, you know, AWS has been implementing features for about, 20 years now, you know, going on 20 years, like 15, 15, 20 years to try and transition like large companies over to Amazon. Um, and then, you know, we're like about two to three years into that. Um, and so that means like focusing on users for whom the features that Filecoin uh, offers confer like a huge advantage. So th this means the integrity checking of the data, having verifiable proofs of the data, being able to select who stores your data, where, having hard proof about that. Um, being able to select to store with like green storage providers as opposed to 
um, just any like being able to have like a certifiable uh, way of checking that your data is being stored in a in a with renewable energy, um, or separately, just hey, it's like dramatically cheaper. It's like a huge cost reduction. Then those are kind of the the good kind of good targets and good first markets too um, for us to go for. Until now, crypto privacy has come at the expense of DeFi functionality. The brand new and high tech railway private wallet on Web and Mobile lets you enjoy the world of DeFi while staying completely private. Create an invisible wallet balance, sell and buy tokens privately and anonymously like a dark pool, and enjoy DGEN DeFi goodness without revealing sensitive information like your address, balances, or transaction history. Railway is available on Ethereum, BSC, and Polygon. Juan mentions that universities would be a good next step to expand the user base of Filecoin since they deal with large amounts of data and run large computations. After universities, who can be the next set of users to adopt Filecoin technology? Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> large governments. Uh, so large governments have uh, also large scale data, data sets, and they really want a kind of commons oriented cloud where they can, because usually governments have important mandates around providing open access to the data. Or, or even if it's not directly open access, even if it's gated by some kind of um, having to get authorization and so on, they want a kind of platform neutral way of doing it or corporation neutral way of doing it. And so that's where IPFS CIDs prefer, confer like a massive advantage because it means that they can address all of their data sets with CIDs and it doesn't matter where they get stored. And then it's a huge bonus that then Falcon gives them a huge cost reduction plus verifiability of the data being stored. Um, once we have the ability to kind of add programmability in there, that's going to then reinforce that because governments want to enable, governments tend to want to have these like data sets where they put them up and provide them, but then people use their own resources to compute over that data and like run their own computations at their own cost. And so Falcon will give people like a pretty good way to do that while preserving some of the outputs or enforcing that some of the outputs get reshared back out to the community in some way um, or that the results get shared with open access and so on. So think of like, yeah, we're like basically within the kind of um, straight shot now to be able to build a massive scale platform for science to happen in where, you know, these massive scale data sets can be stored and computed on and all of the data of the papers and the data of the experiments, all of it is kind of addressed in this kind of independent way with CADs. And you can then run the computation kind of with your own costs or whatever, um, but then kind of reshare all the outputs to the rest of the world in this kind of open access way without having to gate all of your computation on having an AWS account or something like that, which is like super, super huge. Super interesting. Um, and uh, we need to be wrapping up, but one, I mean, one final piece that I, I wanted to to clear up is how how the token uh, like what role does does it play in in this? Yeah, so the Falcon token enables participants to um, store and 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 hire. Uh, so it, it's kind of like the medium of exchange for people participating in the Falcon network. Um, the users use Falcon to hire storage providers to store the data. And on the flip side, storage providers uh, also use Filecoin to stake for the data that they're promising to store. Uh, and so this is one of the key components where in a decentralized, permissionless, open network where you want to make verifiable transactions, um, you need to structure, you need to provide guarantees to the user o over their data. And you need to guarantee that it's going to be around. And the way to do that is with economic incentives. So you, the storage providers have to put up collateral promise it, that they're sort of tied to the promise of them continuing to store the data. And if they don't store the data anymore, then their collaterals get slashed. Um, and so that's like a key component that, you know, the Falcon token is involved in, um, in, that, in that collateral structure. Um, it also kind of helps secure the blockchain itself with, you know, consensus oriented collaterals. Uh, th so think of that as a Falcon is kind of a, a hybrid between um, proof of useful work of like using the useful work of storing the data as part of the securing the consensus and stake where um, stake itself is is part of the collateral structure, which then secures the blockchain itself. Um, so the, and so the token kind of mediates all of these activities uh, plus running the smart contracts. So the 
once the FEM lands, then people can run uh, add arbitrary smart contracts to Filecoin. And so that means that all of the connectivity and bridges from Filecoin to Ethereum, um, uh, you know, running on, on the FEM and the EVM and what we call uh, FEVM or FEVM, which is kind of like the EVM running on top of the FEM, uh, all of that stuff will be, you know, sort of consuming ETH and fill. Um, so ETH on the Ethereum side and then potentially getting like swapped to Filecoin and being spent in terms of Filecoin in the Falcon network to kind of store data or, and so on. We kind of want to get to a point where you can, all of this can sort of happen under the hood for the users. Like the users are just kind of like their applications and their, and their communities can live on whatever chain they, they want. Um, and that's best for, for their application and their community. And then they can hire the services of, of Falcon, like to store data or to, um, uh, compute on data and so on and use whatever token they want. But like, it's sort of getting swapped underneath the hood and sort of spending on, on 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 the network right i mean i wonder if like having to deal with a token might be a barrier for some of the web 2 users that that you want to onboard yeah totally yes so we have seen that significantly and so that's a one of the big things for us to solve uh now so the way that one part of how we're solving that today is that in for a set of users a set of users are kind of working with storage providers themselves directly they sort of like choose a storage provider and then they pay them in fiat or whatever. And the source providers kind of like help do all of the kind of Falcon side of things. Uh, but it's not like a great solution. Um, what we're thinking about now is how to create these um, on ramps, these like storage oriented on ramps for large scale users that um, that uh, pay in, in fiat and then kind of convert to Falcon underneath the hood. This is already how uh, Web3 storage works, for example. So Web3 storage is a product that you know has like a free tier and anybody can just store uh, up to a certain some amount of data for free um, and some amount of like transactional super for free. Uh, if you go over those limits, you, then you start paying and you can choose what you pay and you can pay in fiat or you can pay in other, in other um, currencies. And so you can choose whatever currency you care about and want to pay in and then it gets kind of converted to pop underneath the hood. Um, and, the, uh, and so we want to kind of build that kind of facility for these massive scale data sets. So Web3 storage is tuned for small amounts of data. It's kind of like, and here small means, you know, any kind of Web3 application is small. Like, you know, even something like Google Docs is small uh, for for the scale that we're talking about. Um, the large use cases where you have tens of petabytes or hundreds of petabytes, there you, we need some kind of on-ramp that enables um, traditional, you know, say a Fortune 500 enterprise that is expecting traditional service contracts or whatever to be able to hire the Falcon network to do that in ways that they traditionally understand, but then have all of that kind of be powered by, by crypto underneath the hood. And so, you know, what we sort of anticipate is that there'll be this set of companies that have kind of a web two facing interface for these larger scale companies that then underneath the hood are powered by Falcon. So think of, you know, having a storage company that looks just like any other web two storage company and it, you hire it using traditional structures, but then underneath the hood, it is sort of converting your, you, you like pay it with like a USD wire or a Euro wire or something like that. And then it itself is using Falcon underneath the hood. Um, so that's kind of like an adoption path next year and the year after. Awesome. Well, you know, l like you said, these infrastructure layers took decades to be built out uh, for like, you know, the internet. So um, you're, you're just like a couple of years in building so, and, assume, and already made a lot of progress. Um, super, you know, interesting, really fascinating conversation, Juan. Thank you so much uh, for taking the time. Um, really enjoyed just getting very, very deep into uh, the, the protocol layer of the internet and, and just like this um, view of how Web3 can, can really uh, re replace uh, all of these layers because you know I, I think like I, I I had the idea that blockchains were kind of this value layer on top of all these protocols but had never really questioned that oh m maybe you know these protocols themselves also need upgrading um, so super interesting what, what you're building and yeah thanks thanks again uh, for for the great conversation yeah thank you so much it's been super awesome to talk about all of these things and you know super excited to to dig into all of these layers so um it, into it because i think they really matter for for the web3 community the um you know if i could like in terms of like the length of time that it takes 
um, yeah, like, and I think this is something really important for everybody building or, or using Web3 to remember is that um, our future depends on this and it is a long fight. And so it is a long um, fight to upgrade all of these structures. And the prior developments of the internet took decades. And so it's okay for Web3 to take time. Now we have to kind of accelerate some things to make good impacts faster in some areas, but it's okay if we are kind of like, um, replacing system by system by system. And it's sort of like, okay, to have a really strong value layer on top of underlying kind of um, protocols that aren't yet improved. Um, but we have to kind of have the follow through to then go improve those as things succeed. Um, and so it's kind of like uh, one of these things where applications should really focus on kind of having success with large scale numbers of users. And, you know, we should be building protocols to upgrade each chunk of the internet and kind of each one of those should be in an adoption path and we should start with the easier one so for example filecoin and data storage is way easier than doing computation that's kind of why we did this data storage stuff first and then computation is easier than the networking piece or because the networking piece is going to be way harder that's because how, how do you upgrade like the ip stack that, that's like underneath the blockchain so like all of the assumptions of a blockchain go away like you, you don't even know that you can send a packet to another person like which is kind of an, a, an assumption within a blockchain so so that it's gonna be like a super interesting challenge for us to to work through so you know it, it'll take a while uh build out and um yeah keep keep making the network better awesome and i think it's it's great to have that that kind of perspective especially now when you know like everything seems to be blowing up. Uh, it's good to just, you know, take a step back and, and see, you know, this is really a long-term uh, fight or, you know, development uh, that everyone here is working on. So anyways, thanks again. <laughs> take care.